to this preview of the first stave of Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Um, want to be upfront. I'm going to call this Fearing Echoes. Um, and uh, this will not be a, like a comprehensive overview of all the moments of each chapter. Um, but I'll walk through what my plans are. This is the original manuscript of the first page of A Christmas Carol. And I like showing these to students and new readers because it's a reminder that these these books don't descend from the heavens perfectly structured and edited, that there was a like an arduous process of crossing out and rewriting. And we see this in the manuscript, and we also see it in the um, script he used originally for A Christmas Carol when he performed it, and then the edited one he used. So I think that's important to know that this is a crafted, edit, edited thing. So this is the edition I teach. I have it here. Um, and I like the, the Penguin Classics editions for lots of reasons. I like how they're laid out. I like that they feature a really good introduction. I like that this book features his other Christmas writing. I like that the I like how the words are laid out. I like that the book doesn't fall apart. I'm finding that's happening more and more with cheaper editions of books. So uh, I like this. I think I mentioned I like that it features the original illustrations as well. Another edition, if you're interested in a deep dive, they had these on sale at Barnes & Noble years ago when I got it. It's the annotated Christmas Carol. And this is if you really want to sort of go down kind of rabbit holes. Like if you're, I, I, I just reviewed the notes for Stave 1. Um, this editor deduces, you know, which uh, tavern Dickens would have had his dinner in. And it deep dives into the laws, into the obscure vocabulary. And so if you're curious about any of that, and it also it'll, it'll re reference other novels and sort of patterns of Dickensian thought that are interesting. Um, I don't think you need this if you just want to sit back and enjoy a Christmas book. If you're curious about answers to questions, this would be a really great place to go. Okay, uh, this is my plan for these videos. I'll offer a very brief summary. I think one of the blessings of teaching a Christmas carol is we already probably know how it goes. Um, so it's, it isn't so much about finding out what happens in the book, but it's about how the book unfolds. But I'll quickly summarize the chapter. I'll offer a question that the chapter inspires in my reading. I'll reflect on a favorite passage. I'll offer um, some thoughts on a particularly interesting vocabulary word. And then uh, I'll walk through a creative writing exercise, which I use this novel with my freshmen as a way to help them write their own personal narrative essay about a memory they have regarding a holiday. A lot write about Christmas, but just if they want to write about another holiday, that's fine. But we sort of try to figure out how Dickens' writing moves. Um, what are his tricks? What are his habits as a writer? And we sort of steal from passages of Dickens and incorporate some of those tricks into our own writing. So that's kind of how these videos will be, uh, will be structured. In terms of a summary of Stave 1, right away, uh, I think it's important to be mindful of all the different ways Dickens could have begun the novel. He could have begun uh, chronologically. He could have begun, uh, you know, Dickens with Ebenezer Scrooge's childhood. He could have begun in Cratchit's house. But he began by really emphatically establishing the fact that Dickens' business partner, Jacob Marley, was dead. And then he very quickly establishes the layers of Scrooge's personality and all the different pieces of evidence that suggest that his personality is what it is. Um, we also have a visit from Scrooge's nephew. That happens almost right away. We have then, on the heels of that visit, which bothers Scrooge, two people collecting money for charity for poor folks visit Scrooge's office. They clearly haven't read A Christmas Carol, those two people. Um, Scrooge then returns to his home. And Scrooge then interacts with the ghost of Jacob Marley. So that's basically the outline of, of the first stave. Okay, here's a, here's a question. Uh, what does Ebenezer Scrooge do? Right? What does he do? We know he has a clerk. They would say Clark. Um, Bob Cratchit. It seems like money lending is the main job. Money lending at interest is the main job. Um, and then he works in what's called a counting house. Um, he refers to something being good upon change. And I think uh, that's the Royal Exchange. 
Um, I guess Wall Street would be sort of an analogy. But anyway, um, Scrooge uh, loans money. So I think it's interesting Scrooge doesn't, Scrooge doesn't like build or produce anything. He traffics in just money lending, basically. But that's what he does. So my favorite passage from Stave 1, I have one little sentence that sets up my favorite passage. Scrooge is, 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 is home, and there's like weird sounds happening. And interestingly, Dickens says, Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. And that's set up really early in the novel. So at the end of Stave 1, Jacob Marley's ghost brings Scrooge to the window of his house. And all of a sudden there, there are numerous ghosts and phantoms uh, in the air. So, um, and then he sees this one sight that sort of sets up the moral landscape of the entire novel in a really strong way. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was, clearly, that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. So I just think that's an incredibly strong sort of emotional moment. Um, we don't, curiously, we don't see Scrooge's reaction to this strong moment. I think Dickens wants to reserve such things. And, it, and I think he's setting this up for us. He's setting up the sort of moral stakes um, of the entire novel here that our life on earth in a very disturbing way determines our sort of spiritual sanity in the afterlife and complete selfishness leads to such torturous like hellish moments like this where you're inches away from doing what you want helping the poor frozen in space as a ghost um, that's a particular version of hell i think here's a funky vocabulary word um, bedlam which is um St. Mary's uh, Bethlehem Hospital, which opened, I think, in like the 13th century, but it was a mental hospital in London. Um, as you probably know, and I'm not a scholar of this, but um, Bethlehem Hospital was, um, was known, like before a lot of reforms, I mean, people would go and like watch the mentally ill, almost like you'd go to the zoo, like it was that disturbing. And, um, you know, it was obviously loud, the treatment of these folks you know, wasn't that advanced. So Bethlehem Hospital became um, conflated to bedlam. The slang became bedlam. So anything that was like loud and ruckus and out of control was bedlam. And we still use this term, um, bedlam. So Bethlehem became bedlam. It's sort of like um, pictures a long time ago of Mary Magdalene often had her crying. So Magdalene became maudlin, which kind of means like, you know, crying a lot. Um, sad. So, uh, my clerk with 15 shillings a week and a wife and family talking about a Merry Christmas, all retired in Bedlam. Interestingly, Scrooge doesn't just say like, that's crazy. He says, jokingly, I'll retire to the lunatic hospital where, by the way, the marginalized people are also mostly ignored and treated badly, which, you know, subtext, that's what I'm doing. So I don't know, there's layers here to be probed, but the, the term is interesting. Okay, so here's a creative one writing exercise um, that um, I think, you know, might be handy. And I'll try to do it along the way as well. So the premise is a specific setting for a strong personal memory of a holiday from your past. So think of um, any holiday. Like I'm going to pick Christmas because we're reading a Christmas carol and I have a great story. So... It's Christmas morning when I was a boy. I think I was around 10. My brother was, you know, about four. And he played a prank on us. And I have to tell the story. So before you start, stop right now and think of 
you know, Thanksgivings and birthdays and Christmas and Hanukkah and Easter and any other holiday your family celebrated. And think of just a memory. It doesn't have to be like an earth shaking. It could be just something silly. It could be just a basic tradition, but with vivid uh, 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 associations for you. Stop and just think of one. Think of a specific day. Okay. Next. Write a sentence describing the lighting of the space and the movement of at least one person. Okay. Um, so here's mine. And then, like I said, pause after each of these and take your time and write your sentence. The darkness of the overcast Massachusetts winter morning was altered only by white Christmas tree lights as my father sleepily distributed our presents, yawning as he lumbered into the kitchen and retrieved his much needed coffee. Okay. So we have lighting. It's not a great lighting sentence. Uh, and my dad lumbering because he's tired. Third, describe a sound you can hear in the distance away from where the memory takes place. So I don't really have much here because outside my house, there was really nothing going on. But the complete silence outside of our house was interrupted only by our yawns and the faint kitchen sounds of sizzling bacon and the local AM news station wishing us a Merry Christmas. Okay, so again, you can pause at each of these. Fourth, say something specific about the atmosphere of the room or the space you're in. Like, is it hot? Is it cold? Does it smell a specific way? What was the mood? Um, so mine is, the living room was festive and loud and raucous, carpeted with presents, Star Wars Legos, cassette tapes, a brand new boom box, as well as comically crafted labels on each gift, lip balm from Mick Jagger, a toothbrush from Dr. Sadowski, our family dentist. No gift was opulent, but there was no doubt the joy of Christmas was there. Um, I would emphasize that in good personal narrative writing, good writing in general, but good personal narrative writing, you can't be too specific. Like, I don't love cassette tapes. I have, I have to figure out, like, who's cassette tapes. I had Legos originally. Star Wars Legos is better. Um, so... Uh, Dickens was well aware that the details of a life matter a lot. And I don't think we are very much. If you're going to write about, I don't know, your grandmother's kitchen. Well, the fact that she had like a particular color linoleum floor, you might not, uh, uh, you know, floor in the kitchen. You might not think that matters or a bowl, a jar of Canada mints. My Nana had Canada mints. Uh, you might not think that matters, but it adds color and life and personality to the, to the folks you're writing about. So again, you can pause and write your own sentence. Fifth. Mention at least one person, and it could be the same person or a different person, and reference what they're doing with their hands, and then zoom in on their face and describe what you remember. My father, always an early riser, covered his mouth for what must have been his 50th yawn that morning, a yawn requiring him to close his eyes and release a loud crescendoing moan, as if this yawn was meant to announce his exhaustion to the entire world. Okay, so this is a typical Dickensian trick of, I, I think to a large extent, he's the novelist that invented cinematography, the camera zooming in, zooming out, panning, doing that all the time. So take your time and, uh, and do this prompt. All right, and then a big Dickensian trick to personification. Choose one detail of the setting and personify it. So again, you can pause if you want. The clock stood sentinel and also trickster. The truth of our exhaustion behind its hands. Oh my gosh, it's with an apostrophe. I'm a terrible teacher. After several hours of present opening and breakfast eating, the radio had announced, Merry Christmas, it's 7 a.m. More on that later. And then, mention a detail of the setting and connect it to the faces of the people in the memory. Okay, here's mine. We all gazed at the clock and at the lie of 10 a.m., our mouths widening their O's and dagger glances at my little brother who had awakened at 4 a.m. and changed all the clocks back three hours, his trickery, the root and cause of our profound exhaustion. So this really happened. He's an adult now, and he's really just a taller version of this same little kid. And here's the passage where I sort of got my ideas from. And it's just uh, the where the town is being described. Dickens is heading home, you know. 
Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about them with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses in carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a Gothic window in the wall, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street, at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing suddenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. So even the ice hates people, right? Misanthropic ice, so good. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas, as the Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy beef. I just want to point out that you literally need none of this for the plot of The Christmas Carol to work. However, I don't think it's accidental. And this is the last thing I'll say about Stave 1. I don't think it's accidental that the miser who has such, in many ways, a small life, lives amidst so much, so much vibrant life, right? Um, we have what the poulterers and the mayor and the grocers are doing, and um, just there's so much happening around him, full of, you know, full of energy. Um, and he's just, you know, it's a, as it says, solitary as an oyster. He's the opposite of his setting in every way. So anyway... I hope, um, I hope this helps and good luck with your reading.